Hello, my beautiful babies, and welcome back to Arrakis for God Emperor Dune Club Session 1. How exciting. This is our fourth tour of Arrak Arrakis. I feel so blessed to have all you guys coming back and to lead you through the sands of Arrakis, although there's a lot less sand this time around, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, let's jump right into it with our, boop, oh, well, let's get rid of this. Yep, there we go. Uh, for this session, you need to have read pages one through 66 in this particular copy. If you are not reading from this particular copy of the book, you need to read until you get to the last sentence of the last chapter is, come, I shall bathe you myself. So that is the last sentence of the last chapter you have to read for this session. So yeah, Dune has no chapter numbers, so that's how we do this. So easy enough. All right, let's get into it, kids. Let's get into it. Chapter One, A Voice from the Past. Uh, I'm numbering these chapters. So we are in the far future. There is an archeological announcement of these finds, plus a bonus tour of the newly discovered invisible storehouse of God Emperor Leto II. I mean, they haven't totally confirmed it. This is a really new thing. They're pretty sure it's Leto's. We know it's Leto's. But, uh, and this is at Der Es Balat on planet Rackus. So, I mean, we're so far in the fucking future that Arrakis is now just Rackus. So that's how far this first chapter takes place. Uh, and the discoverers of this storehouse believe that this uh, monumental collection of manuscripts to be the original journals of the god emperor Leto Atreides because A, they used a guild key to decipher it. And this was the key, this was the code, excuse me, that deciphered the stolen journals from antiquity. These aren't the first journals of Leto's that have been, that have surfaced. Uh, the stolen journals preceded this, and they came a long, long, long time ago. Uh, but the same key worked that worked on those. Two, it is on this Redulian crystal paper of an ancient Ixian make. So the paper is really, really old. It's made out of crystal. It sounds really cool. Uh, three, the store the storehouse itself is the uh, an old example utilizing Ixian no-room technology in a very primitive way. Now, this is the first time we come in contact with the idea of a no-room. A no-room is a mechanical space in which everything inside is shielded from prescient, prescient vision. So anyone who's prescient, they can't detect this room or anything that's inside of it. Uh, also, there are the oral recordings found that are by Leto II in Paul's voice. He liked to kind of talk as his dad, <laughs> do that whole thing. So right now they're contacting the Bene Gesserit to authenticate. And also the writing itself points to the author as having direct experience with ancestral memories. Um, and fun fact, uh, the storehouse, planet Rackus, the scattering, and no rooms are all very much a part of the next two books in the series, but we'll get to that next summer. So this exciting announcement is followed by a live reading from an excerpt from the first page of these journals that they have found. And this is our first taste of God Emperor Leto II since we saw him ascending the throne at the end of children of Dune Club. At that point, he had the skin that was not his own, the sand trout cilia skin suit. And in this uh, reading, he is spouting some cryptic fucking bullshit. <laughs> but essentially, I, it took me a minute to figure out what he's trying to say. And this is my interpretation. There could be other interpretations. Maybe you have your own interpretation. Um, but he is saying that he is a storehouse of human history. And when he seeks for information, he is besieged with an overwhelming amount of answers from his ancestral memories that he becomes totally lost in the experience. And it takes him, he gets so lost in his memories whenever he asks them a question that it takes him a minute 
to figure out who the fuck he is. Like, what even his fucking name is when he comes out of it. Um, and so, but, he, and he's like, you know, he's, and he's, uh, he's also, um, he is Leto. So it's like, he knows he is Leto. He is this entity, but he's also everyone else in his memories, all of these lives and his ancestral memories. Um, he is able to access the experience of dying. He's able to access the experience of giving birth. Uh, he and many, and so many times that it becomes boring. Okay, that's the main thing you need to know about the God Emperor Leto is that he is bored as fuck. And even though his power is, that this power is very valuable and it's a wonderful thing that gives him this very singularly unique perception of the world, it doesn't change his present reality, which is being trapped in a giant worm body and uh, it sucks. <laughs> he's bummed because he's it just, you know, he's just, he's the backbone of this family. He's the backbone of this household. He's trying to keep it all together, but it's it's hard being in this warm body. And, you know, I like to think that Leto is truly a, a non-binary entity since he has both, you know, all these female memories and lived, he's lived all these female lives and lived all these male lives. Um, so let's go to chapter two we have the stolen journals. So the stolen journals were mentioned. They came from antiquity. And um, the header for this chapter is an, is an excerpt from the stolen journals previously mentioned. Again, letting us know what a weird alien Leto is, uh, who has chosen this morning to be born in a yurt at the edge of a horse plane in a land of a planet which no longer exists. So that's what he did this morning. What did you do for breakfast? I was born in a yurt, and uh, and he's complaining about he, people were so much better in the old days. He's like, people were so much better. He's, he's like the quintessential old man, like, back back in those days, people were better. People suck now. They're like so whack, you know, but it's like, well, they're whack because you kind of made them whack a little bit, but whatever, it's fine. Um, this chapter is kind of reminiscent of uh, Rogue One, if we have any Star Wars people in the house. Uh, we discover how the stolen journals were stolen, by whom, and for what purpose. So it's been 3,500 years, give or take, since the Dune times. Okay, since uh, since we last, you know, since the last book. Arrakis is very different now. There is a forbidden forest. There is the Kynes Sea that people fish out of. There is the Idaho River. There are orchards. There are museum Fremen, we'll talk more about them later, and D-wolves, these security wolves that patrol the forest at the edge of the last desert of Arrakis, the Sarir, which contains the god emperor's citadel forest. So there's only one desert left, and it's Leto's. Eleven rebels broke into the citadel to steal the citadel's schematics in order to find Leto's epic spice hoard. Okay, he's got mad spice and everybody wants a piece and they want to figure out where this is. So they're going to steal the plans to the Citadel and they find the goods, but they also find two strange enciphered volumes uh, and, and decide to take them with them. One of the rebels, only one, makes it out of the forest. Everybody else is uh, already killed or eaten by the wolves on the way out. And it is none other than Siona Ibn Fu Fuad al Sayafa Atreides. I butchered that, but it's a really long name. It was Siona. I call her Siona. You may call her Siona. I don't care. Uh, with And she's got the plans and the journals in hand. And at the end of this chapter, she vows revenge for her fallen companions. And she curses the god Emperor Leto. So buckle up, kids. We're getting ready for an Atreides versus Atreides epic battle in this book. It's going to be great. <laughs> so moving right along to chapter three, we have Leto's Peace. So uh, this is exposition time. We get a whole download of exposition. And this comes from Leto's journals yet again. Uh, a we find out that the golden path is the way that humanity must be guided to ensure its survival. B, we learn that in order to keep humanity on the golden path, it must be shepherded, shepherded 
long term by an entity that can sustain itself for thousands of years. Hello, beans. C. Paul saw that to keep humanity on the golden path, he would have to take on the sand trout skin and become a weird worm god, and he just couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't go through the body horror. He was already too far into being a human, uh, wouldn't do it. But Leto did do it. Leto took it on when he was about nine years old, so he hadn't gotten too far in yet. He hadn't even reached puberty yet. So he's like, okay, fine, I'll just, I'll do it. It's fine. Um, so because Leto did it and took the plunge, things are on track. Humanity's on track. We're on the golden path. You know, I mean, we could still slip off, but things are looking pretty good. Uh, and also he has just kind of totally taken over and he's sustained taking over mainly because he killed spice production while maintaining a gigantic horde for himself, the one that they were looking for, uh, monopolizing Melange to such an extent that the Bene Gesserit, the Spacing Guild, the Great Houses, and everybody else who uses the spice has to play by his rules or you get no spice from daddy. Okay, so like that's that's the deal, kids. You're going to do what I say or I'm not going to give you any fucking spice. So through this game, he has enforced what is known as Leto's Peace for over 3000 years. There is no war. Imagine. Imagine it. No war. We're always, ah, you know, we want peace. We say we want peace so bad. And he's like, you know what? You want it? Here it is. I'm going to give it to you. And even though he's lived for a millennia, uh, he knows that he will experience a final metamorphosis, a likeness of death, but not it's not actual death. It's not actual death, but it's like as close to dying as he can get. And he doesn't know how it's going to happen. He doesn't know when it's going to happen. He doesn't know who's going to be a part of it. It's going to be a big surprise. All he knows is that it will happen. And when it does... At that moment, he will know whether the golden path continues or whether it ends and humanity is fucked and we end up killing ourselves and perishing. Now, he is currently about 23 feet long and about six feet in diameter, his worm body. He's got a face that's, a you know, stuck in there. It's got like a little cowl around. He's this pink face and this gray cowl around it. Uh, he's got his arms and arms and hands, you know. But his legs have become these weird vestigial flippers that have kind of like grown back on his body. Uh, and he rolls around on his royal cart made by the Ixians. So he's got like a little royal cart that he, you know, rolls around on. It's pretty cool. Uh, they also made him a machine that he uses to write his memoirs called a Dictatel, where whenever he just thinks, hey, turn on and start recording my memories, it starts recording his memories and starts typing it out on this crystal paper that's like uh, one molecule thick. Like paper that's like one molecule thick. Like what are you talking about? Like that's out of control, but whatever. Uh, he knows that Siona stole a couple of copies of the journal. It was on shittier paper though. It wasn't on the good, good paper. And he watched her run away with them, but he did nothing to interfere with her or the D-Wolves. And he did not foresee her stealing them, but honestly, he doesn't care. And he's glad that she survived. He would have let her die, because he can breed another candidate, but she's really special to him. So he's willing to, to let it go. And he states at the end of this chapter that Leto's purpose is to be the greatest predator ever known. The greatest predator ever known. And in nature, predators are regulators. I mean, a lot of us think, oh, predators, they're, they're, they're bad or they're evil or something like that. But in fact, they're needed to maintain balance among organisms. Uh, they create diversity and they strengthen their prey both through natural selection and by forcing their prey to develop anti-predator adaptations. So that's what he's doing. He wants to whip humanity into shape and he is doing that through becoming the greatest predator ever know. That's his function. So let's move on to chapter four. We've got the Wellbeck fragment. Uh, here we go. So now we have met the rebel mutant Siona. 
let's meet her dad, Maneo Atreides. So this is her pops, and they're having a conversation. And Maneo is Leto's right-hand man, like his, his head servant and his number one stan. So we have this real fun interplay between the dad and the daughter, the daughter who hates Leto and the dad who is totally committed to this guy. Uh, and they're arguing about him. And um, and it's funny because Leto has just said, I'm the greatest predator ever known. And Cyano is just like, this guy is a stone cold killer. Leto's a killer. He's a killer dad. And Maneo is like, you know, it's not really him. It's not really him. It's, I mean, sure, like the worm kills, but it's not Leto who's doing it. And like, so I was like, he's killed like nine Duncans, dude. And she's like, it's, no, it's, it's not like that, okay? Uh, you gotta separate the art from the artist, okay? You gotta separate the art from the artist. She's having a real hard time with it. She's not really buying it. Um, and she asks him, well, how are you not dead yet? Because everybody who hangs out with this guy ends up dead. And he says, well, I, when I see the big worm coming, I get the fuck out. That's what I do. And that's how I've stayed alive. Uh, and he, she's just, she's still not buying it, but he's like, I said what I said. So, so not only do we have Leto kind of versus Sino, even though Leto's on Sino's team, she's, you know, vowed revenge against him. And then you have Maneo, who's like torn in between these two people, this poor guy. Uh, now we have chapter five. This is Duncan's last day. And this was my favorite chapter in this session. There's so much to discuss, so many laughs, so many good things. Um, the header starts off, uh, Again, Leto is telling us about himself, what it's like to be this mutated worm god. And he is, not only is he seemingly invulnerable uh, and prescient, his senses are so sharp. His vision, his hearing, his sense of smell. He says, it would horrify you what I can detect by smell alone. It would horrify you. You'd freak out. You don't want to know what I know about you just from you walking and I can smell you, which is amazing. Uh, and later, that is echoed in the chapter where Duncan's odor preceded him. The man was high on his own adrenaline. So when this new Duncan comes in, he can immediately smell that this guy is just like, he's all fucked up on the adrenaline. Um, so another thing that's really fun about this chapter is the crypt. We, we have a few scenes in the crypt in this, in this book. And it is a huge underground situation. There's a big hub in the middle. And it's like, it's, it's hard to even grasp how big it is. It's so large. And it's radiating spokes like a wheel. And in each of these giant spokes are catacombs for uh, the products of the Atreides breeding line uh, since the Dune times. So you've got people's bones, people's water, You've got some spice to fool people uh, who, you know, potential raiders who think that this might be the storehouse. There are also false walls. There's mad tunnels underneath this that nobody knows about. Like Leto installed these tunnels himself. And he loves this place because he's a worm and worms like to tunnel underground. And I, I love that he loves this place. It's like, of course you do. Of course you love your worm tunnels under the earth because you're a worm. And it, he just, it's, I got such a kick out of it. We've also got an angry Duncan walking into Leto's crypt like a fly into a spider's web. Uh, Leto has already been tipped off by the guild that this Duncan has been told that a new Duncan is being prepared by the Leiloxu. And he's afraid that he's getting ready to be replaced. And the Ixians have given him a laser gun. So, you know, here we go. We've got, we had a Duncan Idaho Gola in the last book. This is, this is our, the newest Duncan Idaho Gola. And by the way, the guild will snitch on anyone threatening the spice production. Well, not production, but anyone threatening the spice because they know that if Leto dies away from water, there will be no more spice ever. No more spice, no more guilt. So they're not really allies, but they're definitely on the side of spice. So they'll definitely snitch. Uh, and I love that Leto reflects on his earlier, on an earlier Duncan's death and their exchange is really great. Um, 
Leto says that chance is the nature of our universe, which was one of my favorite quotes from this chapter. And Duncan says, not chance, mischief. You're the author of mischief. And Leto says, mischief is the most profound pleasure. It's in the ways we deal with mischief that we sharpen creativity. And that harkens back to the greatest predator statement. You know, he, he is mischievous. He is causing some issues for humanity by taking over and ruling as a worm god for 3,500 years. It's a big problem. <laughs> like, humans aren't really into it. They're not really into it. And, but he's doing this because he wants to sharpen humanity's creativity. And then Duncan spits back out at him. You're not even human anymore. He's, he gives him a little burn. And like the closest that Leto can come to anger is irritation. And he is irritated. He's just like, like that's the way. He's like, fuck you. Like, I know I'm not human, okay? Like, it sucks. Like, I don't want to be here either. Like, poor Leto. But then Leto comes back uh, with, your life is becoming a cliche. Telling Agola, and there's been hundreds of golas by this i mean like maybe thousands of golas by this point like he's had so many fucking duncans and he's just like your life is becoming a cliche like that's such an amazing sick burn um and duncan reveals a bomb he's got a bomb he's got a bomb and leto is so pumped because he did not foresee this and he loves surprises that's how bored he is he's he loves surprises so much even if they might threaten his life, but he knows that he's fine. Like a, a bomb isn't gonna do anything. And Duncan is like, well, you haven't predicted this and you haven't predicted your death. So this is gonna kill you. So you should be afraid. And Lena's like, it's not, BB. It's not even gonna like do anything. I'm so sorry. And then it fucking goes off prematurely and kills the Duncan. Duncan's like trying to get rid of it. And then it just like blows up in his face. Like I was dying. I was laughing so hard reading that. Um, but now he comes to the current Duncan, the current Duncan Gola is coming into the mix and Duncan and Leto play reports or lays gun. What is it going to be? Is it going to be more reports or is it going to be the lays gun? He knows he's got it. He, he sees it in his fucking briefcase. He's like, oh, it's heavy. It's in there. I know he's got the gun. And, uh, Duncan first chooses reports. We go through a few reports. First report is what are we going to do about Siona? You know, she, she stole some shit. I don't even know what she stole. And Leto's like, oh, it was the plans for the Citadel. And he's like, what? How could, how could you let her get away with that? And he's like, no, you let her get away with it. And I was like, again, I was like, oh, man. He is just, Leto's got those sick burns for people. Like, he is just ready to fuck somebody up. Um, I was cracking up. Then, too, they talk about a cult of Alia that's been found on Giddy Prime. Uh, and Leto is so amused. Again, he's like, he doesn't even care. Like, like all these problems. He's just like, it's amusing to him. He's like, oh, this is just a revival of ISIS. And I just think it's lovely how they've united my grandmother and my, and my aunt into a single goddess. And I just think that's so cute. And, uh, but really, it's a bit of Jesuit cover for looking for undiscovered Harkonnen spice words. So move on, Duncan. What else he got for me? He's getting bored. He's getting really bored. And Leto gets so bored by Duncan's reports about the rebels that he zones out, uh, which is relatable content as uh, I, I zone out. I am guilty of zoning out when people are talking to me about boring shit. I, I, I've done it. I do it. And uh, he begins reflecting on all these repetitive conversations that he's had with Duncan's about rebels. And we get some really awesome ideas about rebellion. I really enjoyed this part a lot. Um, and I'm just going to read, I kind of put all of his rebellion quotes together into one thing. And I just want to repeat them because I was just like, they were just like, like blowing my mind when I was reading them. All reb all rebellions are ordinary and an ultimate bore. They are copied out of the same pattern, one much like another. The driving force is adrenaline addiction and the desire to gain personal power. All rebels are closet aristocrats. That's why I can convert them so easily. Radicals are only to be feared when you try to suppress them. You must demonstrate that you will use the best of what they offer. This is their weakness. Radicals always see matters in terms which are too simple. Black and white, good and evil, them and us. Oh my gosh, it's so true. Uh, and by address, and by addressing complex matters in this way, they rip open a passage for chaos. 
The art of government, as you call it, is the mastery of chaos. Chaos is no surprise. It, is, it has predictable characteristics. For one thing, it carries away order and strengthens the forces at the extremes. They're creating new extremists, new radicals, and they are just continuing an old process. There has never been a truly selfless rebel, just hypocrites. Conscious hypocrites and unconscious hypocrites. It's all the same. It's all the same. It doesn't matter. And I was just like, ah. Oh. And Duncan's like, well, what about a radical who sees the complexity and comes at you that way? And he's like, that's not a radical, Duncan. That's a rival for leadership, bro. <laughs> and you either co-opt them, you join them, or you kill them. That's it. That's how you deal with it. And Leto becomes so lost in thought that Duncan catches him napping. He catches him off guard and pulls the laser gun on him. And I, I just love it when like Leto comes to him and he's like, oh, oh shit, like Duncan's got the laser gun. Like, oh, he caught me napping. Um, and of course, Duncan goes to how many? How many? How many of me have there been? They're obsessed with this question. I get it. I would probably ask the same fucking question. Uh, and Leto hits him with the sad Muad'Dib voice and then the mad Muad'Dib voice because that usually like quells the Duncan. Um, but then, uh, and, he, and he falters a minute. And when he falters, he just literally hits him with his giant worm body, much to Duncan's surprise. Duncan's never seen him off the cart, had no idea he could jump and roll around like that. <laughs> and is totally caught off guard and is crushed to death. Um, and another thing about this chapter that you need to remember, other, other great things about this chapter is we find out Leto has taken away the Bene Gesserit's breeding program and also does not allow artificial manipulation of human genetics by the Leiloxu. He runs the breeding program uh, and the Duncans sometimes act as a stud. So he breeds the Duncans back into the breeding, you know, into the, into the program. And he does it for their mongrel strength and as a genetic throwback to act as a fire dampener. Leto really wants to breed a Duncan with Siona. He was hoping that maybe it was going to be this Duncan, but obviously that's not going to work out. Um, we also get more deets on Leto's empire. There is no interest and no credit allowed. He got rid of the whole bullshit credit banking system crap that just keeps all of us in such bondage. <laughs> it's like, I'm just like, ah, I love it. Like you just, if you want to, if you want something, you just got to pay for it. You just got to pay for it. And there's only one coinage in the empire. It's got his face on it, uh, but, and it's based purely on the spice standard. So instead of the gold standard, there's the spice standard and it just keeps getting more and more valuable. And it's so valuable in fact, that you can carry the price of an entire planet in your hand luggage. That's like, it's like, oh, I, billions of dollars, pallets of whatever. No, 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 it's just coins. And so because of that, because coinage is so insanely high, most people trade. If most people trade. I feel like that's really what's going on. He's like, nope, you got to trade and there's no interest. And I love it. I love that there's no credit allowed in the, in Leto's empire. And he thinks to himself, control the coinage in the courts, let the rabble have the rest. Which I'm like, yeah, that's that's how you control people. And, you know, that's how we're controlled. Yes, yes. Uh, there's also some more details on Leto's body. So uh, he tells us he can crawl or roll or toss his body with astonishing speed. Uh, and we also see that. So I love that he tells us and then he shows it to us. But that sometimes he falls on his flippers. <laughs> He's got those little weird vestigial feet flippers. And sometimes it hurts. It hurts if he falls on one of those fucking things. And Duncan, in fact, gets one with his lays gun and it hurts, it hurts, but it's fine. You know, it's like, it's singed off. It immediately heals itself. It's not that big of a deal. And another thing that I really liked about Leto, another weird little detail about him is that he has to act out a sigh. Like he doesn't breathe. Like he doesn't have like lungs, you know? Like his body's just, I don't know what the fuck's going on in there, but. He doesn't have to, he, does, he doesn't have to sigh, but he has to act one out. <sighs> just as, just as dramatic effect for the Duncan. And it's like, it's so cute. And I love that he can blink his whole face. So he's got that cowl around his face and apparently he can just, it can just like that. Like if he thinks he's like, if something's trying to go for him, 
he can just blink his face, which I'm like, I would love to see that. And also, his brain is no longer associated with his face. So the Duncan was aiming for his head, but his brain are now nodal congeries throughout his body. So it's not even, like, he doesn't even have a human brain anymore. It's just, like, a bunch of weird nodes throughout his body. Like, there, there's nothing there. You know, that would definitely not kill him. So, yeah. So we learned so much in this chapter. It was such a fun chapter. Like I said, I laughed out loud uh, more than once. And let's go on to chapter six, Leto's weakness. So now, you know, we've, we've learned that he's nigh unvulnerable. We also know that he does you know, go at some point because we have this, these people discovering his journals and he's not around anymore. But um, we're back at Rebel headquarters and we meet Nyla. And Nyla is this muscular brick of a woman who is charged to obey Siona in all things by her god emperor Leto. And she works as a spy for him. And she's really uncomfortable with this arrangement because Siona's a rebel and she's always asking her to do shit that she like really doesn't agree with and really doesn't want to do. But because she promised, she's going to do it because she's she loves God. You know, she loves Leto. That's all there is to it. And she is sending a secret transmission on an Ixian device. She's also had something implanted in her brain so that Leto could contact her like brain to brain. But it hasn't happened yet. And fun fact, I just want to mention that Frank Herbert is really into onesies. He's really into onesies and unitards. She's wearing a onesie. Siona and her rebel crew were wearing onesies like so many like like in the next books like everyone's wearing a onesie I just feel like I love that Frank Herbert thinks like onesies are the fashion of the future like that's what we should be wearing is unitarts like fuck you guys put on a onesie I'm just like you know and the thing I like onesies but you have to really have your shit together to wear one because if you're out of shape at all and it just it onesies don't look good on everybody and even, like, I won't wear one unless I'm, like, really, you know, got it going on at the moment. Um, another thing that uh, I like about Frank Herbert and I've noticed is that he loves concealed technology. He loves to conceal it. He doesn't want to see a button or a light switch or anything or a panel. Everything's always, like, concealed, which I'm, like, aesthetically, yeah, I agree. I mean, it would be cool if you could have a house and you just like, oh, you're done with your TV. Just it's just concealed behind a wall. Now you don't have to look at it anymore. I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, so anyways, uh, Nyla is done with her transmission. She goes, she meets up with Siona and her bitch ass assistant named Topri. And Siona grills Nyla on why Nyla obeys her, even though she doesn't always agree with her. Like Siona's, you know, I mean, she's like the head of the breeding program of Leto's breeding program. So like she's pretty advanced. She's a smart cookie. And she's like, I know that you don't agree with me, but like, why, why, why do you do whatever I ask you to do? And Nyla's like sweating it. She's like, oh fuck. Like I have to answer truthfully. She's going to know if I don't tell the truth, but then I don't want to, I don't want to be known. I don't want to reveal that I'm a spy. So she says, I have sworn to God that I will obey you, which is true. But Siona takes it in a totally different direction and is like, I knew it. You're just, you're a believer and I'm a believer. And like, that's what unites us. And I love that Topri laughs. And then Siona roasts him and is like, you don't believe in anything, Topri, not even yourself. And I was just thinking, wow, I want to burn someone with that one day. I was like, I, I want to use that on somebody where it's like, you don't believe in anything, not even yourself. You know, like what a sick burn. Um, but, you know, Nyla believes, Sino's like, I believe that's what holds us together. And I thought it was really interesting that she's saying this to Topri because this echoes Leto earlier talking about the Ixians, who, how the Ixians believe in their technology. They believe in their science. They are true believers. And because Leto, he doesn't believe in the same things. He doesn't believe in their technology or their science. He believes in his golden path. But because they're both believers, they got something going on, you know, like it, it bonds them together, which I thought was really interesting to see, like Siona kind of saying the same thing. Um, and Nyla is just, she's so relieved. She thinks to herself, I may speak the truth and it works only for my God. And this just proves to her that God Emperor Leto is like magic. He's God. He's God. She said the truth and it worked out fine. You know, she had faith. She took the leap 
it worked out. It only goes to prove to her that, yes, Leto is God. Um, so Ni or, uh, Siona goes on to share the discoveries that she found pressed between the pages of the stolen journal. And there is a strand of Ganima's hair, Leto's sister, and a starflower blossom, and a poem of mourning that Leto wrote when he heard that she had died. And uh, she, Siona discovers, you know, puts it all together and is like, oh my God, he loved his sister. He loved it. He loved somebody. He's capable of love. That's his weakness. His weakness is his capacity for love. And I'm going to use it against him. And like, she's so fucking crazy. But, you know, she's right. But she had no idea. She had no idea. And that's the thing. It's like, man, he may be like a godworm, but like, he's still, hum there's still part of him that's human in there. There's still part of it. Like, why people think he can't love? Like, I don't get it. But whatever. She figures it out. Uh, and, uh, and it's also, it is nice to, it is nice that Ganima just kind of had a nice long life, you know, she had a nice long life. And it's sad though that he was like so bummed when she died. So let's move on to chapter seven, clean up in the crypt. So we listen to the first of many conversations between Leto and his main man, Maneo, who is a lean machine. He is efficient. He is organized. Uh, he's even, Leto's even accused him of being manufactured by the Ixians because he's just so, so efficient. And he comes to clean up the dead Duncan, uh, of which there have been many during his lifetime. This isn't the first dead Duncan he's had to clean up. And fun fact, only 19 of all the Duncans that ever have been created have died natural deaths <laughs> which i thought was really funny like oh those duncans they're wild they're wild those duncans so first they get down to business before maneo removes the body he's instructed to disable the laser gun so that leto can present it to the ixian ambassador so he's gonna like leto's gonna be like i know you're trying to get me killed like what do you think about this? I'm like, fuck, fuck with the Ixians. Um, and he's like, give the guild snitch 10 grams of spice and let their, and let our people on Giddy Prime know that there's a Harkonnen spice hoard around and I need you to find it. I need you to beat the Bene Gesserit to it and then I need you to use it to pay off the Leilaxu for our new Duncan and the rest we can just, we can just put here. Uh, and then they move on to family. Mene was torn. He loves his daughter, Siona. He loves her. He's, you know, he's her father. But his duty to the god emperor comes first. And we find out that Topri is Maneo's agent. I mean, we already knew that guy was sus. You know, everyone knows Topri is sus. But now it's confirmed he's Maneo's agent. And Leto is just so pumped for Siona and her mutation, which is the ability to fade from prescient view, even though she herself is not prescient. So she is an entirely new model of human, her father has no idea about this talent of hers, uh, but this is exactly what Leto's been looking for. And again, when we were talking about he wants to be the greatest predator ever known, that is an anti-predator adaptation. So she has finally, uh, somebody has adapted to where you have a human who cannot be seen. She fades. Sometimes she's there, sometimes she's not. Uh, but she's not always there, and that makes her a wild card. It makes her a wild card. Then uh, we go in and talk about the ferionic disease. Leto says, I have seen people and their fruitless societies in such repetitive posturing that their nonsense fills me with boredom. He is so bored. He is bored by everything and everyone. He's seen it all. It's really boring. Um, and Leto's job is to break humanity out <laughs> of the repetitive posturing of the ferionic disease, where you have powerful tyrants who are produced by the shared myth of government that was broadcast by the ancient Romans. So he's like, okay, humanity, you love strong leaders. You love strong government. <laughs> You, you pray for a god to come down and, like, fix everything. Oh, yeah, you guys, is that what you guys want? Is that what you guys want? Well, check me out. I'm all those things, bitch. I'm all those things. See how you like it. And humanity doesn't like it. And Leto's kind of giving humanity that approach where, like, say, say you want to quit smoking. 
And so you decide to smoke so many cigarettes in a row that you throw up and become sick. You just you just chain smoke and chain smoke until you just feel totally disgusted. And you become so disgusted that you never want to smoke cigarettes again. That's how, that's how he's trying to bust humanity out of the pharaonic disease. He's like, I'm going to give you strong leadership. And we're just going to do this for a long time. We're going to have a, we're going to have a big old government. And I'm going to give you so much of that, that you're never going to want to do it again. You never want to do it again. You're not going to want to do this ever again. You're never going to want an emperor ever again, ever, ever. And it's really cute. Then he goes on to think about how armies are the means by which governments take hold. And in their ignorance, they tend to unleash powerful technologies that they are not capable of competently managing, which cause major problems when these technologies inevitably escape into the public, eventually trickling down into the hands of the individual. And that in humanity's hatred towards the other, we create the instruments of our own undoing you know like everyone's undoing so i was like oh that's, that's some nice thoughts there we'll, we'll get more into armies later in the book so let's go to our final chapter duncan's first day so we got a new duncan you know clean up clean up the old duncan we got a new one he's fresh fresh out of the oven and the header in this one again he's talking about how boring how boring everything is i assure you that the ability to view our futures can become a bore. Even to be thought of as a god, as I certainly was, can become ultimately boring. It has occurred to me more than once that holy boredom is good and sufficient reason for the invention of free will. I love that header so much because it reminds me of this Alan Watts uh, lecture that I was listening to where he was talking about how you know, we are a God who's dreaming. He's just, because we're just so bored, you know, like a God who's, who's all powerful, who can have anything and do anything and is omniscient and, and everything and everywhere. It's boring. It's boring. And so, you know, he's made himself forget and just dreams that, you know, we're all these separate little people and, you know, that's for fun. That's for fun because it's boring. It's boring to be everything. So we get our fresh new Duncan. And he arrives on Arrakis, and he is intercepted by two women of the Imperial Guard. One lady named Luli, and the other one is Masked, named The Friend. And they have to make sure that he hasn't been tampered with by the dirty Leilaxu. There's a, people really don't like the Leilaxu. And, I mean, if you follow along with the next two books, you'll kind of, you, you'll find out why. You know, you'll just be like, oh yeah, that, that is pretty fucked. They're pretty gross. Uh, and this poor dazed Duncan is just trying to wrap his brain around the fact that he died 3,500 years ago, that Paul's son has become a weird worm god, that there's fanatical women in the Imperial Guard. He's like, what is there, like women and they're fanatics? Like, what is this? He's supposed to command the Royal Guard. So he's just like, oh, okay, like, uh, whatever. And then training of mentats has been banned so that's another thing leto's taken out of the system and also he thinks if he's just one one in a long line of duncan golas what happened to his predecessor and he finds all of this to be very sus he is not really into all of this it's kind of freaking him out and you know i'd be freaked out too i totally get it so uh so that's it for our our first session for our next session session two you need to read pages 67 through 140 and the last sentence of the last chapter is the duncans always begin that way God, can you imagine how annoying it would be if someone's you know there's just been so many of you and people have like dealt with you so many times. You're like, I don't know who you are, but they're like, they know you. And they're like, oh, this is how you always are. And you're like, excuse me? <laughs> like, that just would be so annoying. It would just be so annoying. Uh, poor Duncan, that poor man. He's just, he's just like really, he's having a real hard time. And I get it, I, I would be really annoyed as well. So, uh, so now we are going to start our questions 
and answers section of the uh, of our live broadcast here. But before we do, I just want to remind you guys to support this channel when you join patreon.com slash DanicaXIX. And also when you order merchandise from DanicaXIX.bigcartel.com, like these little dune packs, like these little dune packs with like little Lido's peace pens. And now that we're, re I'm so excited. Now that we're reading the book, you get how cute this pen is. You know, it's so cute because you have a little Lido and it's just like, it's like zened out in front of like a sun and it's like Lido's peace, you know, but like everybody hates it. But like, it's really cute. It's really zen. Um, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, and leave me a comment below.